His people and given us his presence. So let's do that. God, we love you. God, today is your day. God, we surrender ourselves to you and ask that you would have your way, God. We ask that you would come and you would meet in this place in a mighty way. God, you have promised that where two or three are gathered in your name, that you would be there. So we don't have to ask you to show up, but we just ask that you would be here in a great and mighty way, God, that we would feel your presence with us today. God, we give you ourselves. We love you, and we thank you for loving us, God. Amen. Go find somebody to hug. Let's do this. Baby, baby. 
going on in our lives. It doesn't matter if everybody walks away from us. It doesn't matter any of that. God, you never fail. God, this morning we have reason to bring you praise. And we do. And God, we love you. Help us to realize all that you have done for us, God. Help us to understand what that means, God. And as we sing, don't let us just sing words, but God, let us sing prayers from our hearts as well. Let's go back and let's sing that again. You stay the same through the ages. And let's think through what we're singing here. You stay the same through the ages. Your love never changes. There may be pain in the night, but joy comes in the morning. Oceans rage. I don't have to be afraid because I know that you love me. Your love never fails. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No way can compare your living home. Your presence mine. I'm the sweetest 
the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your your prayer this morning is that God would fill this place and flood this place and we would be overcome with his presence. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Ushers, come on up. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for today. God, we thank you uh, for your word. Your word says that you would never leave us and you would never forsake us. And so God, we are claiming that promise today that you are with us. You are in us, you are in our midst, and we can hear you and feel you and experience you this morning. God, we pray you'll bless our time together and bless this offering. We pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to talk to you this morning out of Ephesians 6, 12, which we'll see what that is. First of all, you know, religion is no good, right? Amen. No good. We don't want religion. We want a relationship. It's a big difference. Religion can mess us up horribly. Well, anyway, you know, David Letterman used to have like the top 10 signs, blah, 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 blah. So I thought I'd do it. Top 10 signs that you may be religious. Here we go. Number 10. You know all 27 verses of just as I am, you may be religious. Number nine, you came to church just so you could play in the church softball basketball league. It's a big one, y'all. You may be religious. Number eight, you ever miss church with the excuse, listen, the disciples were fishermen. It's okay. This is one of my favorites. Number seven, you may be religious. You think premarital sex is wrong because it may lead to dancing. 
that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Number six, you have, have you ever prayed so loud in a restaurant that the people beside your table bowed their heads with you? You may be religious. Number five, you've asked for a church discount at a yard sale. Pretty good point, y'all. Number four, it's all right. You've avoided the use of cooking wine because it might make your brother stumble. Number three is my favorite. You may be religious. If you've ever bummed a cigarette off a church deacon, you may be <laughs> religious. Number two, you think little league sports are of the devil because it keeps kids from church every single day. Then the number one sign that you may be religious is if you have a bumper sticker on your car that reads, in case of rapture, car will swerve as my mother-in-law takes over the wheel. <laughs> Not bad. Not bad at all. Alrighty. Like I've already said, right? Religion is not good, true? It is man's attempt to basically please God. Religion cannot please God. Religion believes that God needs our help in order to live this life. What I want to show you this morning with the help of the Holy Spirit is that God doesn't need our help. In fact, what messes up our Christian walk with God is us. And it's, well, you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, Matthew 5, 3, I've said it to you many times, it's the Beatitudes, it's the start of it. And you know, of course, all Beatitudes build on one another. So I've said this before, if you're not doing Beatitude number one, forget number two, three, four, five, six, it doesn't matter. Beatitude number one, it's a foundation step, it's step in stone. The first Beatitude, this is of course in the NASB, is blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. That's the first one. That's the most important one. That's the Christian life. Blessed are the poor in spirit. And one more time, when are you poor in spirit? Now, when you're poor in spirit, it's a sign that, man, God, I'm totally in need of you. We get rich in spirit when we think we don't need God. I know nobody in the room thinks that, and I hope that's true. Uh, the message says this way. You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there's more of God in his rule. So we just basically need, as a believer, to understand this. God, I can't do this life, right? When you came to God to, to forgive you of your sins, you knew you couldn't save yourself. Is that correct? And if that's correct, say amen. amen. You knew you couldn't do it. But something happens in the Christian life because as we live the Christian life, we get this mindset, I think I can do this. I think I can live this life. And when you think you can do it, and when you think you can live it, you're messing up. You can't do it. I can't do it. That's why we are always totally dependent upon the Holy Spirit of God to live this life. And the greatest day in our life is when, once again, we understand, I can't live this life. I need God. I couldn't save myself. And not only, I can't live this life. Uh, Matthew 16, 24. Jesus says this. If you want to follow me, you must first of all, guess what you got to do first of all? Deny yourself. Just stop right there. Then he adds two more things. But the first thing, you must do what? Deny yourself. The preceding verses, here's the story. Say four verses up. Jesus says this, hey guys, guess what, guess what? I'm going to go to Jerusalem. You know what's going to happen? I'm going to die, and they're going to kill me. When Jesus says that, our beloved apostle Peter says, wait a minute, Jesus. You're working too much. And, G and Peter, guess what? He rebuked Jesus. Now that's some guts. He rebuked the master. Jesus then tells Peter, get behind me, Satan, you don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then he says this. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if you want to follow me, you must deny yourself. Or in other words, he's saying this. Peter, Matthew, all of you, I'm going to go to Jerusalem and die. But if you want to follow me, you got to die. Not only am I going to die, 
But if you want to follow me, you have to die also, and you have to die to you. Because it is myself. It's me, myself, and I. It is myself that keeps God from working in my life, and that's the biggest trouble we have our whole Christian life. It's me. Now, I'm going to show you in the next few minutes what I'm talking about. And when repentance happens, and repentance is such a great word. Uh, you know, I've been working with uh, addicts, alcoholism, drug addicts, I mean, for a long time. And what I've learned is this, and this is not my stuff. This is what I get from these people that do this for a living. They say there are three steps for an addict. Now, if you're here today and you're involved in alcohol, or if you're here today and you're involved in drugs, maybe you know what I'm talking about. Uh, here's the first sign. When you are first addicted to a drug, or you're first addicted to alcohol, here's the first stage of denial. This is always happens. They will say this. Oh, I'm all right. It's cool. Don't worry about me. And so they will basically be in denial. I don't need any help. I'm all right. I can take care of this. I got this under control. Well, finally they see, man, I'm not. I can't do it. So they get, then they go to the second step. And here's the second step when it comes to substance abuse. They say this. You know what? I have a problem. I do. But you know what? I can still take care of it. No, you can't. No, I can't. I can take care of it. And so you know what they do? I'm going to stay dry or I'm not going to do drugs, but then I go do it again. Then I go do it again. And we say, we say, I thought you had it under control. Well, I do have it under control. Give me another chance and I'll show you. And I do it again. And you, see, and, you, and you scream, I thought you had it under control. I do have it under control. And then the third step is this. Here's when we know an addict or an alcoholic is ready to get help. And it's when they come to the third step. The third step is this, when they finally say this, I don't have it under control. I'm messed up. I can't do it. I need help. Would somebody please help me? Yes, I'm an alcoholic. Yes, I'm a drug addict. Yes, I confess. I cannot put the bottle down. I cannot stop injecting the needles in my arms. I got to keep on doing it. I really have a problem. I can't help myself. I've tried and I've tried and I've tried and I've failed and I've failed and I've failed. And guess what? I can't do it. When they get to that point, they say, finally, we can help you. But you now must go 60 straight days without anything before we can help you. Now, when you get that far, we really know it's out of your system, and we really know you really won't help, but you got to go that far. Now you're probably thinking, man, how can an addict, how can an alcoholic see they got a problem? They're addicted. I submit this to you today. We're all addicted. We are. You know what we're addicted to? Us. Self, because we think we can live the Christian life. And I'm here to tell you, no, we can't. But we think we can do it. And I'm here to tell you again, no, we can't. That's why we need Jesus. That's why we need the power of the Holy Spirit. We can't do this, but we try to do it in our own power. Um, Acts 3.19 says, now repent of your sins and turn to God that your sins may be wiped away. That word repent is a great Greek word. It's metanoa, metania, something like that. Meta, it's metanoa, metanoa, metanoa. It's two words to make one word. Meta means change. Noah means the mind. So guess what the word metanoa means? Guess what the word repentance means? It means what? Changing the mind. Metanoa, change the mind. For us to have a change in our life, it's got to have here first, it's got to change our whole mind. And I have the definition of repentance according to the Word of God, and they're going to throw it up. I'm not going to preach each point because there's a lot of points when it comes to repentance, but the essential characteristics of, gen of genuine repentance is not with that. So when God says, I want you to repent, it means all of this. Repent of your sins. It includes all of this. First of all, it means what? 
Change of mind. Metanoia means what? Change mind. It's a repentance. First meaning is what? I changed my mind. I am now changing away from that point. The second point is sorrow over sin. Uh, I don't know. But when I was a sinner, I'm going to tell you, I was one of the best ever. I loved to sin. Didn't you? See, you know what that is? That's pride. If you were a sinner, you love to sin. But the religious pride in you will not allow you to say, yes, I did. Isn't it amazing? I'll ask you again. When you were a sinner, did you love to sin? Yes. Yeah, that's better. You just admit it. But see, there's this, 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 this pride in us so much. We even hate to admit when we were lost, we love to sin. That's how much pride we have. Isn't it amazing? I'm telling you, it is what keeps you from living the Christian life. It is what keeps you from going on with God. You got so much, we have so much pride in us. It just keeps us from saying, yeah, that's me, God. That's me. You want to look so good in front of people. Well, general repentance means I changed my mind. Second of all, it means I have sorrow over sin. And I'm here to tell you, and you're the same way. If you're here this morning and you are saved, say amen. amen. But when you were lost, you loved to sin. And you did. You know why? It was your nature. That's what Paul says. You know why? You know, you, do you know why else? Because your father was who? The devil. You had a father and Jesus says, his name was the devil. He was your father. He was your ruler. That's why you love to sin. I mean, when you sinned back in the day, did it bother you any? No. You loved them. I mean, I hate to say this, <clears throat> but I was one of the best cussers in Guilford County. Not too many people could cuss better than me. I, was, I, was, I had a master's degree in it. I was that good. It was unbelievable. I remember at six years old, you wouldn't believe at six years old how much I used to cuss. My family, they were all lost. They taught me how to cuss, and it was, it was incredible. I would cuss so bad. I remember at six years old driving in the car, and they said, Charles, let us have it one time. Oh, you blank, 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 blank. And they'd laugh, and they said, man, that's good. I said, thank you. I like that. Thank you very much. And I, I mean, I, at six years old, I mean, I would cuss like nobody's business. I've said it before, I cussed so much I could cuss the wallpaper off the wall. I cussed so good. Playing football at Western Gilbert High School. No exaggeration. The referees would come to me before the football game and they would say, Moses, yeah. Clean your mouth up. I mean, we, we hadn't even had the first play. And they said, Moses, yeah. The reason being, when I was on that offensive line, Man, I would let him roll. I would say, you blankety blank, blankety blank, blank, and your mama, you blankety blank, 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 and your daddy's even worse, blankety blank. I mean, you wouldn't believe the cussing. And them guys would get so mad, and they wouldn't think and concentrate. Boom, I'd jack them up. They had no idea. But you know why? I love to cuss. You have no idea. No idea. Well, I got saved in 1980. I'm driving home from church. My cousin Vernon and I, and Kurt and Vernon led me to the Lord. I'm driving home from church. And I'm, it's, in, it's in the month of April. It's, uh, I'm driving a red Ford Galaxy. Remember those cars? I'm driving a red Ford Galaxy. And I'm driving down, driving down West Market Street. And I'm saying, man, salvation. And for the first time, I repented of my sins. And God came into my heart. And man, I felt like, oh man, this is so incredible. And Vernon says, man, you should have done it a whole lot sooner. I know, Vernon, I should have. And I said, yes, this is incredible. I got so much peace and joy and the guilt's gone. It's incredible. And I'm driving to the projects where we lived in, in Greensboro. And we turn off there and we go into the projects and I back the car up. I always back the car up. I put the thing in reverse. And uh, that's when you had it on the column. I put it in reverse. And I mean, I, for some reason, I slammed that pedal down. Boom! <laughs> and that car... I had a wreck, and I hit another car. It just wasn't anybody's car. It was Skip's car. 
Who is Skip? Skip is one of the biggest drug dealers in Guilford County. He's our neighbor. And I hit Skip's car. I thought, oh, no. I've been saved 15 minutes. Then I hit my first wreck. That's what I thought. When I got out of the car and I looked and I saw Skip's car, I did not hop out of the car and say these words, glory to God. <laughs> I didn't say that. When I saw Skip's car and the damage I had done to Skip's car, I did not say, well, thank the Lord above for that good thing right here. Thank you, Jesus. No, I didn't. When I hopped out of the car, the first thing I said was this. Blankety blank, blankety blank, blankety blank. I mean, I started cussing like nobody's business. I said, blah, 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 blah. And I mean, about that time, it's like a hand came out of heaven and the Holy Spirit grabbed my tongue and he said, whoa, you don't talk that way anymore. That's my tongue. And you don't say those words. I could have said those words 20 minutes prior and it wouldn't have bothered me a bit but I've been saved 15 minutes and I've already committed my first sin. And the Holy Spirit said, whoa, Charles, you don't talk that way now. You're a child of God. And I don't like that kind of speech. You quit saying that. And you know what? I quit. How do you know you're saved, y'all? How do you know you walk with God? This is easy. You can't get by with anything. Any kind of sin, it grabs you. If you can sin and it doesn't bother you, it's one of two things. Either number one, you don't know God. I don't care how much you're in church, you don't know God. Or number two, you're backslid. So if you can go out here and sin all you want to do and I see all this kind of stuff, you may go to camps, you may go to church, you may sing the songs, but you know what? I'm here to tell you, you don't know the Lord. Because if you sin, it bothers you. Can I have Amen. Well, that's repentance, repentance. I, it's just there, man. Uh, it's a change of mind. It's sorrow over sin. Uh, it's a personal acknowledgement and confession of sin. Yes, God, I have sinned. It's turning away from sin. Growing up at Gifford Western Church, a preacher came to a church one time, and he said this, when you are born, he said, I'm going to tell you what repentance is. When you are born, you're going to hell. You're going to hell. You're going to hell, you're going to hell, you're going to hell, you're going to hell. But you meet Jesus and you what? Repent. Boom. You're going to heaven, you're going to heaven, you're going to heaven, you're going to heaven. It is a personal turning away from sin. It is now. And, and repentance involves three things. It involves the will and the mind and the emotions. All three things are involved with repentance. Can you prove that? I would, be, I would be glad to. In Luke 15, verse 17, you know the story. It's the prodigal son, right? The prodigal son. He gets mad. Dad, I'm tired of doing the chores. I don't want to mess with the hay anymore. I'm tired of feeding the cows. I'm tired of doing this and that and everything. Else. Blah, 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 blah. Dad, I want, my, I want my money and I'm leaving this place. Dad says, son, are you sure you want to do that? Dad, I want my money. I want out of your rules. I want out of this stuff. I'm out. I said, okay. So dad gave him his stuff. You know what he did? He got on his camel like and he rode off down in Jerusalem. Don't know where he went. We don't know how long he was gone. We don't know if he was gone five days. We don't know if he was gone five years. We don't know if he was gone 25 years. The Bible doesn't say, but he was gone for a period of time. He got in a mess. Finally, he saw, man, I am really messed up. Here's repentance. What does it involve? The mind, the will, the emotions. Hey, throw that other chart up. I forgot I had that one. Yeah, that's my, 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 my. I was going to draw this, but I can't draw that good of a circle. I had this come to me like three weeks ago, and I messed with this sermon, and I thought, that's it. Will my, you see that, is that red? Yes, I'm colorblind. That's red, right? How many times have you told God, listen, God, I'm sorry I did that. I won't do it again. You ever said that? God, I'm sorry I won't do that. And guess what? You did it again. God, I'm sorry I won't do that. You did it again. Usually when that happens, you might have the will and the emotions with repentance, but you don't have the mind 
Or you have the mind and the will, but you still have the emotions. For true repentance to happen, all three things must be involved. That's pretty tough. It is. Can you prove it? Well, I don't prove it. The word of God proves it. The prodigal son says, here is, of course, here is when it comes to the mind. When he came to his what? Senses. Whoa, that's the mind. How many of my father's hired men? Then we see in verse 18, he, we see his will. He said, I will go to my father's house. So we have, first of all, the mind. Then we have the will. Then we have the emotions in verse 19. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me one of your hired men. There we see true repentance. Uh, I got one more story, I guess. Let me look. Yeah, good stuff. Leave it alone. That's not bad. Not today. Yeah. Mm. Okay. I'm going to close with this. If you're a child of God, say amen. 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 Child of God, do you have a sin or sins in your life that you've been trying over and over to conquer, but it still weighs you down? Probably, yeah. I can say it for you. Yes, Charles, I do. Yeah, I know. And how many times have you told God, I'm sorry, and God help me? But you know what? You're here today on May 20th, 2018, and it's still kicking your tail. Yeah. Paul said in Romans 7, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I hate, I do. Oh, God, won't you help me somehow? I got saved in 1980. And this thing called cursing, or cussing is what we call it in Gilbert County. Cussing. I mean, God really cleaned my mouth up just like that. But then there were some things in my life that just stayed there, and I couldn't get rid of it. One of the worst things I had was a bad temper. My staff today can tell you sometimes I see that thing manifest. And it does sometimes manifest. But I'm here to tell you it's not the way it used to be. It was the way it used to be. It was all the time. I remember I got saved and I would lose my temper and I would do this. Oh my, God, I'm sorry. Father, I'm sorry for my bad temper. I shouldn't have cussed that guy out or I shouldn't have done this. And God, I'm sorry, forgive me. Amen, thank you. Five minutes later, boo, God, I'm sorry. And Lord, I shouldn't have done that. I lost my temper and Lord, forgive me. 30 minutes later, God, I'm sorry again. Boom, boom, boom. I mean, does that sound like some of us? The God, boom, and boom, and boom. I thought that thing, I thought I could beat it. I was an addict. I'm, ad I'm addicted to me. I thought I could beat that temper, and I was an addict to me for three years. For three years, I fought this beast. I thought, I got a problem, but I can, I can beat it. And for, th and for three years, it slapped me all the time. It reached its boiling point at college. Here I am in Central South Carolina in college in Child's Hall. I'd just taken a Greek test, and I'd failed the Greek test. I think I made a 39. That's a good failure of a Greek test. This is back in the day when you carried all your books right here. You didn't have a bag. You just looked like a dummy going down the road like this. And so I had in this hand, I had my notebook, and I had my Bible, I had my uh, lexicon and I have my Greek New Testament and I have these books and I'm going up to Child's Hall third floor I'm in Child's Hall third floor and my roommate's named Dwayne. It's in the winter time, it's kind of cold and I put my books on my desk and now in Child's Hall, in our room at least it was like table I mean desk, desk bed, bed so Dwayne's is closest to the door mine's against the window, I go and I sit down and I'm thinking I made a 39, how did I make a 39? Didn't I conjugate that verb right? Luo, Louie, Louie, I mean Louie Nama. I'm looking at this stuff. I'm thinking, Gnosko, Gnosko, where did I mess it up? And Dwayne said, hey, man, what's wrong with you? I said, Dwayne, you ain't going to believe it, man. I filmed a Greek test. He said, what did you make? I said, I made a 39. Dwayne's from High Point. That's all right. He looked at me and he says, man, you're stupid. <laughs> I looked at him. 
Uh, uh. We'll just call him stupid. I paid, I, but I, I didn't lose it. That was big for me. I didn't lose it, I thought. I'll let it ride. Call me stupid. Uh. All right. So I'm looking. I mean, it's so hot. Dwayne was always sick. I always had a cold or something. So hot in that room. We had one of them radiators. You know what I'm talking about? The ones that spit all the time. I mean, that thing spit in heat like you wouldn't believe. And I thought, I said, Dwayne, it's, it's, it's hot in here. He said, I'm sick, man. And I thought, you're always sick. <laughs> he said, I'm sick. I said, well, I'm not. And I'm hot. My name is Dr. Seuss. <laughs> and uh, I went over there and I raised the window. And I got my, I got my Bible. I'm looking at that word Luan. I got my Greek New Testament. I got my lexicon. I got my concordance. I got all this stuff. And I'm studying that thing. Where did I mess up conjugating that verb? Blah blah blah. And Dwayne said, Charles, I told you that I'm cold, and you raised that window. So he got up, walked past me, and lowered the window. And he sat down. And I said, Dwayne, it's like 100 degrees in here. I'm really hot. And I raised the window back. He said these words, are you stupid or what? Call me stupid twice. So I had fits of rage. When I was in Bible school, I, you can ask my wife, I literally fought people in Bible college. Can you believe that? I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm fighting people in Bible college. And, and Carla would say, Charles, you can't die. He's a jerk. She said, well, what are you doing? I said, well, he deserves it. And you know what I got mad about? That guy was from Eden, North Carolina. Football rival. I thought, I'm from Greensboro. You're from Eden? It's on, bud, right now. It's on. And I mean, I was just so, but then I would say, oh, I love Jesus. <laughs> And I repent. So, I mean, I had a fit of rage. I mean, it was really amazing. I mean, whew. anger, I told you this, anger is one letter from what? Danger. Yeah. An angry person is a dangerous person, especially when with fits of rage. I had fits of rage. Before I knew it, he called me stupid. I had my, I had my concordance. I closed that thing. The cordless is about that thick. I picked that baby up, and I jerked from the table, and I read that thing back, and I said, you will never call me stupid again. And I came across, and I mean, I hit him in the head, and I'm not exaggerating. His head, like a duck, bobbled. And I said, I'll knock you again. I'll knock you one more time. Try me. I'll knock you again. And he just said, he said, I said, yeah. I went over there, I raised the window fully, and I said, you shut your mouth, and I'm going to study. And I sat down, and I thought, and I got my Bible, and I thought, where did I mess up with that verb? <laughs> <laughs> and I began to, again, study the Bible. Can you believe that? Dwayne's over there with ear with blood coming out of his ear. <laughs> Literally blood coming out of his ear. I look at him, I'm thinking, you don't listen, you feel. <laughs> and I'm in here, and during that time, this is in the winter. This is in the winter of either 2012, 2013. I mean 2003, 2004. It was in the winter of that. I mean 1980, I'm sorry. It's not 1980. <laughs> See, that's a stroke moment, boom, right there. It was in the winter of 83, 84, okay? And um, the Lord came to me during that time, and he said, Charles, that temper's got to go. And if you don't get rid of that temper, I can't use you. And I said, God, I've tried so many times. I'm trying to do better. I'm trying to get rid of it. And he said, you can't do it. 
You know why? Self. I was addicted. I'm like that drug addict. I'm like that alcoholic. We won't say that, but I was addicted. I'll tell you what happened. It was camp meeting the following year. So when we did a lot of camp meetings. Coy York was the evangelist. And he stood at Colfax, North Carolina, at the campgrounds, and he said these words. If you allow him, the Holy Spirit can take areas in your life and fill that area, and he can knock out, and he said this, fits of rage, jealousy. Je and all, he lists all these sins, and the, and, the, and the Holy Spirit said, I can do it. I can do it if you let me. That night, the altar call was given. Do you know how many people went? None. And I stood there, and I thought, God said, I'm talking to you, Charles, but here's what he told me. But you're so concerned about looking good in front of other people, you won't come to the altar. That may be some of you. God has spoke to you this morning about some areas in your life. We're going to give an altar call, but you're so concerned about looking good in front of people, you won't come. That's how, that is how much self controls you. You'd rather look good in front of your peers than look good in front of God. Because God's speaking, and you won't move. Yeah. I went that night. God did a work in my life. But see, the thing is, he's still doing works in my life. Amen? I'm just saying this to you, simply this. Jesus said, if you want to follow me, you must do what? Deny yourself. So, if the Holy Spirit today has spoke to you, he wants to do a work in your life. And if he's doing it, you need to come this morning and say, Lord, I need a work in my life. I can't do it. That's all stand.